Okay, so it looks like we are live. Uh, let me just check one thing. Cool, so, all right. So I just want to start by saying, oh, okay, hold on one second. I'm getting that we're not live yet. Okay, I think we're live now. Yeah, we're live. All right, awesome. So um, thank you so much for being here and attending our workshop today. And um, we are going to be talking to you all about how you can learn the skills that you need to get hired as a developer and what that process really looks like. Um, and in particular, we're going to be talking to you about what stuff is really important in the process and what stuff you actually can ignore, um, which isn't always obvious, I think, when you're getting started. So to begin, I want to introduce myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Otto Bernier. I'm the founder and CEO of Skill Crush, and we are a digital community for um, for women learning to change their careers with technical skills. And I'm really, really excited because I'm here with a very special guest, and that is Avi um, Flom. You know, Avi, I don't actually know how to say your last name. <laughs> That's okay. It's Flom. It means a plum tree. Boom. 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 No, I don't know. That's okay. Bom. Okay. So this is embarrassing because Avi and I have known each other for a long time. And I just totally tripped up on that. Um, but uh, Avi is the co-founder and dean of the Flatiron School. And um, if you guys haven't heard of the Flatiron School, the Flatiron School is one of the top development boot camps in the country. And what's really amazing about the Flatiron School is that they are only um, a little over, or a little about four years old. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, and they've already graduated a few hundred students who've gone on to jobs in all kinds of tech startups and big brand name Fortune 500 companies and are basically out and doing amazing work. And I was going to be talking to you guys a little bit more about that. Um, but what I personally love about Avi and the Flatiron School is that they take a really what I would call soulful approach to learning to code. Um, and what that means is that for them, learning to code is all about falling in love with programming and falling in love with using computers to do really important, impactful work. Um, and I'm really excited because Avi's going to be talking about that a lot more later on in this webinar. And I think you will all find it incredibly inspiring. So Avi, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Do you want to introduce yourself a little more? Yeah, thanks so much, Ada. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Avi. Um, I've been programming uh, almost like professionally for like 15 years. I started learning code when I was like 11, uh, mostly because I signed on the internet uh, in like 1994. And I was like, this is going to be huge. This is going to change everything. And uh, <laughs> I always wanted to kind of do something meaningful in my life, I guess, even from like a young age. And uh, you know, when I saw the internet, I was like, I'm going to build this thing. This is going to be big. And uh, I started to get taking code really seriously. And then kind of just kept on finding jobs. And you know, one thing led to another. And then I was in college. Um, I was studying film at the University of Wisconsin. And a hedge funds in New York, which is where I grew up and uh, where I'm from, uh, contacted me and offered me a job. So I dropped out of college and uh, started my career um, at like 20. And then I worked there for like three and a half years. And then I started another company called Designer Pages that I ran for four years. And then I was kind of actually a little burnt out. And uh, I took a, I wanted to take a year off. And uh, I was just teaching on the side because I really do love programming. And I love sharing it with people and talking about it. But I didn't necessarily want to do it all day anymore. So I kind of started teaching. And then I started mentoring my students and getting them jobs. And one thing led to another. And now it's like four and a half years later. And we've had over 1,000 graduates. Um, we have a amazing. Uh, um, placement rate, and uh, it's been really great. I mean, you know, it's unbelievably powerful how uh, how much learning to code can change people's lives, and it's been quite a privilege to be able to share that with people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and a little known fact is that right as I was starting Skill Crush, I actually taught a summer program at the Flatiron School, and I think it was your first high school class. Um, yeah. So I have a super special place in my heart for the Flatiron School um, and everything you guys are doing. So. Um, before we begin, I want to make sure that you all who are watching um, just are aware of how this workshop is going to work. So the goal of today's workshop is to give you a better understanding of what it takes to transition into a tech career, and in particular, what skills you need in order to succeed in that career. And as you heard, Avi has a lot of experience with this. So um, what Avi's going to be sharing with us is his insight gained from teaching thousands of students in person at the Flatiron School and um, even more students online via the learn.co verified program, which he's also going to be talking about more with you. 
Um, and what he does is he really works hard to teach students the skills that they need to jump into awesome, exciting, lucrative careers. And as you heard, it's working because they have an incredibly high placement rate. So what I think is going to surprise you a little bit, though, about what Avi's going to share is that it's not necessarily the skills that you think that are really important. But I don't want to, um, I don't want to blow up your spots and we let you talk about that but by the end of this workshop you will have a much better understanding of what you can do to get the skills that you need to get hired in tech and in particular which exact skills you really need to get and which ones you can sort of um, you know punt until later and we promise that all this information will be relevant even if you're just starting out um, as a total beginner and have never written a line of code in your life that's totally fine um, we're excited to talk to you so throughout this webinar we are going to be asking you to comment so please do that in the Facebook comment feature right below this window um, you should see it right below here and um, we are going to take some time at the end of the webinar to answer all of your questions well I I don't know it depends on how many questions you ask so we're gonna do our best so um, and then one last thing is that we have some really great promos that we're going to be able to um, offer you as part of this webinar. So everyone who attends the webinar will be getting a $250 coupon off for um, Flatiron's online coding bootcamp, Learn Verified, which I was also going to be talking about. And um, Skillfish is actually going to be giving away two free blueprints So um, to people who tweet about this webinar. So in order to enter that you need to send a tweet of quotes or takeaways or really you know fun facts that you learn in this webinar and make sure to tag skill crush in the flat iron school so we can find your entry um, but of course um, if you've ever attended a webinar with skill crush before we'll make sure that no one leaves empty-handed so um, you're also going to be getting the verified jobs report from the flat iron school and that's sort of an amazing document that goes into how um, you know what their rate of success is, how they've gotten ninety-eight percent of their boot camp grads hired, um, how much they're making, and you get to really sort of see. And I know that it's like independently audited and all these fancy things, so it's totally legit. And you'll learn a lot about the work that they're doing. Um, and then we're also going to be emailing you an ebook, and um, the ebook is called "The Ultimate Guide to Landing Your First Developer Job." So. Um, and it goes more into detail about all the stuff we're going to be talking about, which is you know how you what you need to do in order to start working as a developer, what developers actually do, and the skills that you will need to get hired. So let me pull up the slides because we made them, and I want to share them with everybody. Okay. Okay. So. Um, before we dive in, I want to hear from you and know where you're coming from. So what brought you to this webinar? So, um, you know, do you ever worry that you won't be able to learn to code? Like, are you concerned that maybe it's too much for you, that, um, you know, transitioning to tech is going to be too difficult? Um, please, you know, let us know. I think it's a really common fear. Um, are you struggling to decide if a coding program is worth the money? So I know that this is a question that we hear a lot. I'm sure it's a question that Avi deals with a lot. Um, you know, I think what you'll see in the jobs report is that the students who enroll in this boot camp are really getting a huge payoff for what the money they invest. And actually, obviously, we'll be talking about this more. But um, we'd love to hear from you if you're sort of trying to weigh the you know potential return on investment on making this investment in yourself and your education. Um, are you worried that you won't be able to find a job in the tech industry? So of course, you know, there's lots of we could have a really long discussion about what you know defines the tech industry, but. Um, I'd love to hear from you guys if you're sort of trying to figure out the job market and trying to understand it and you know wondering what it takes. So you know I think these are all concerns that I've had and I know um, you know Avi's path is a little bit different than mine in that he came to programming a little bit earlier, but um, I'm sure that this is something that Avi you've seen with a lot of your students. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, as you said kind of earlier, I think that people have like this. Um, sort of idea that you have to like have been born in the matrix or like be half computer in order to be a programmer or some sort of mathematician. Um, but you know, we've had students from really different and diverse backgrounds that have been successful. Um, and you know, when we look at our admissions data, um, we find that the number one indicator of student success is basically how much how much do they want it? Just grit and passion um, really is the best predictor of someone's success in programming. Um, and we have a you know tremendously diverse backgrounds of our students that um, you know you would never ever think would make programmers but actually turn out to have very successful and um, you know interesting careers uh, and I'd love to share with you two of those stories if possible 
Yeah, please do. Yeah, no, and I know because, you know, like at Scale Crash, we have students also, you know, I think they're both coming from all walks of life and they're also looking for different things. So some students are looking for full-time work, some are looking to freelance or part-time. Um, but it's so good because I think that we all have this very specific and preconceived notion of what it means to work in tech, what a tech worker looks like. And I know that from my experience, it's actually much more diverse than it appears from the outside. Um, so yeah, tell us about... Um, yeah, so uh, this is one of our students, uh, Jess, and uh, she was a, a freelance digital marketer consulting for companies like Disney, um, basically managing their Google AdWords campaign, uh, which, you know, also it's interesting because marketing is getting more and more technical, um, and Jess right. enrolled in Flatiron School um, and uh, ended up, actually, we just, you know, she turned out to be such a great programmer, and she loves us so much. Uh, we hired her as a developer on our team, and she helps build Learn, which is our um, online program. Um, and she also has this really popular YouTube channel called Comp Chomp, where she talks about all these crazy things in code. And just, you know, again, that enthusiasm and that passion, I think, creates such a rich career. Um, so she was able to transition pretty quickly, and uh, she's on our team now, and we love her. Um, and then one of our other students had another really interesting kind of career path. So Stephanie um, was actually a music assistant, uh, or an assistant at a music label. Um, and she enrolled in our school, um, you know, graduated, became a programmer, worked at Splash, um, which is like an event website, uh, for like 18 months. And that's kind of an interesting transition too because I think one of the things that made um, Steph so successful at Splash was she had a lot of events and promotion experience coming from um, you know, working in the music industry. And uh, you know, as a programmer, basically building a platform for event websites, I think she was able to add a lot of value to the team. And uh, you know, both on a, on a product level, and what she discovered about herself, was that she actually enjoyed that aspect of the career more. Um, so then instead of writing code all day, she really ended up started taking a lead role in the product at Splash and then made another transition after to become product manager and moved out to San Francisco and now has a really popular blog on Medium about product management and the tra transition from you know, a career as an assistant to a programmer to a product manager. Um, and I think what's awesome about kind of learning to code is that it's one of the most in-demand skills and I think that once you get your foot in the door um, as a programmer, you really can transition into a lot of amazing roles at some really exciting companies. Um, yeah, could you talk to us a little bit about, uh, more about what a product manager does? Because I know that it's one of those really, I mean, like I am I think I actually am a product manager at heart, truly. Um, so this actually is funny for me because I'm like, I'm probably a lot like Stephanie mm -hmm. um, in terms of my sort of career trajectory. But I know that it's the kind of role that I think is really um, it's not known by people who are outside the tech industry. Sure. So, um, you know, product management is probably a little bit different in every company, but I think at the heart of it, it is the process with which you can conceive of how to create value for your customers or your users um, and, you know, kind of ideating uh, features and transitions and kind of improvements on things, uh, measuring that, and then also uh, delegating it, managing the process of actually building it, shipping it, QAing it, um, you know, making sure it's not buggy, and then reporting on the success of it. So I think, you know, on one level, I think product management is like one of the funnest jobs in that you get to touch so many different aspects of a product um, from, you know, features that uh, you want to see, you know, happen to measuring it with analytics to actually breaking down the work and delegating it to programmers, looking at that workflow, and then finally shipping it. Um, so it's a, it's a really hard job to kind of cut your teeth with and prove yourself at. But again, I think like, you know, first becoming a programmer and being really in the trenches of product development um, and then kind of being, you know, stepping outside and saying, okay, well, I can build these things, but what are the things we should be building and how should we improve our process to be able to ship better features for our customers and our users? Um, I think it's a really exciting role. And, you know, Steph is a great blogger and writer also. And, uh, you know, I just think that uh, people that have these kind of diverse backgrounds and other previous life experiences end up doing tremendously well in tech. You know, there's like this myth propagated by the media that like all good programmers must, you know, be like white males that have been doing their whole life. But I find that like, you know, at our team and our students, um, you know, the more diverse of a background you have and the more perspectives you have on jobs and experiences, I think the richer you can contribute to a team and to a company. Yeah, and I think I think product management is actually a really perfect example of where this can really play out because it is kind of like the marriage of it's a very clear place in which the marriage of kind of the creative aspect of things and the technical side really come together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I would love to take a moment, um, actually, because that really you know segues well into like my own story. I know you know I know that some of you are Skill Crush 
you know, audience members and you've maybe heard the story before, but for those of you who haven't heard my story, um, so unlike Avi, I did not, how old were you when you discovered the internet and decided you were going to build it? <laughs> I must have been like, like 12 or something. Okay. Um, I did not come to it quite so early, although to be fair, when I was like 11, I did take this like, I took some class in my sixth grade class where um, we made GIFs, so I guess I have some street cred on this front. But um, yeah, so I, you know, was totally like the traditional liberal arts major, went to college, was a studio art major, um, you know, did not, did not even for one iota, like, think about coding or computer science or anything like that. And for me, um, my dream was really to graduate and move to New York and be a writer, artist um, kind of person. And I was really, really interested in working in media. And it's particularly, like, I had this, like, dream of, you know, working at the New York Times. Um, and then, you know, I, I, this was, probably, I guess, like 2008 going into 2009. And, you know, for those of you who remember that time, it was not a good time to be in the workforce. And particularly um, in New York, it was a really, really bad time to be in media. And at that point, I had been doing sort of these different odd jobs, um, bouncing around from like media publication to media publication. And I ended up taking a job at a digital agency um, where I was in a non-technical role. And got, I think I was there for seven weeks and then got laid off. And it was, you know, and it's funny because I'm thinking back on it now and thinking about like Stephanie's experience. Like I definitely had this experience where I was at this company and, you know, here we were all working together to build these digital products. Um, but when it came to sort of like deciding who could stay and who could go, my contribution as somebody who wasn't technical was being so, I mean, I was, I was suspensable, right? Like it was so undervalued in comparison to the technical people. Um, and it felt really unfair. Like I felt like I was contributing and I had, you know, good insight and perspective and whatever. But at the end of the day, when push came to shove, my lack of technical expertise was a liability. Um, and so that was really, you know, the, the kick in the pants that I needed to, um, you know, to, to get myself some skills that I knew would kind of allow me to, you know, take all this creativity and art and all this, passion I had um, and make sure that I would still always sort of kind of like, you know, I don't know. I don't know if it's like have a seat at the table, but really be able to, um, you know, really point to my contribution. So from there, um, I started to learn to code. And this is around the time I think, Avi, that I first may have met you. And I think it was like right around the time when you were starting to teach Rails on Skillshare or something like that. This is like right around the same time. I think we had some overlap. Um, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, so I, um, anyway, so I started to learn to code and what was crazy about it is it totally changed my life, like almost instantaneously. And I think I actually, um, I think that they prepared some really nice um, embarrassing slides for me. Oh yeah, this is me graduating super, <laughs> my team likes to embarrass me. Um, so this is me doing some odd jobs while I was unemployed, which is, you know, fun, but not sustainable. Um, so what I ended up doing was I actually ended up starting a company with a friend of mine um, where we built websites for people. And almost immediately, we were working for all these amazing media publications. And it was really, it was a really interesting experience for me because I had come at it from the other side before... Um, can everyone see my slides? Yeah, okay, just checking. Yep. Um, so before this point, I had really come you know, like I had been trying to write for these publications um, and I had been doing some like ph photography work and it was really hard and it was like, a, you know, it was unstable work and it was hard to get it. And then I learned to code and I started to be able to do things like, you know, build election maps and build like real time data and news apps and stuff like that. Um, and it was this total game changer. Like all of a sudden these doors that I felt like I was having to bang down were like flung open for me. And within a year of starting our business, we had, work, we had, we had gotten a really, we got hired to work on the, um, the London Olympics for the New York Times. So it was like this total dream come true. Um, and what I really learned in the process, which I think is, you know, what Avi is also talking about here is that I had thought that this transition was going to be really hard. Um, and I think more than that, I think I thought that it was going to mean sort of giving up on everything that I had done before. Like, I, I think when I made the decision to learn to code, it was driven by like a really, really practical need to make money um, because I was unemployed and I just got laid off because I didn't have coding skills. But then it turned out that it wasn't 
like it, it, like it actually sort of allowed me to continue to do all the things that I love to do, but I got to do them and make money and get, you know, and more importantly, I mean, obviously money matters, but I think, um, it's, you know, you want to be doing work that you think is interesting and valuable and means something. And that I got to do work that was even more meaningful and felt like it had a bigger impact. Um, and so that was super exciting. So, yeah. And I know that you talked about your, um, your background a little bit, although I do think it's worth talking about Carly Kloss. And she was <laughs> sure. um, so, hey, I'm Avi again. Uh, so, yeah. So I've been, said I've been programming for a while and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm self-taught. I've never taken a computer science class, but I have written software patents. You know, um, I've taught myself algorithms. Um, in fact, like I just I, I love learning things. Um, I'm a student pilot. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess one of the interesting things about programming is that it's taken me to places I never imagined. Like I remember when I was in high school and I was like in my parents' basement, you know, at two in the morning, like learning how to code. Um, I never imagined that I'd end up teaching Rebecca Minkoff and Carly Kloss how to program that, you know, I would be able to meet Martha Stewart and speak about being an American entrepreneur. Um, so, you know, I think that over the last 15 years, you're seeing programming proliferate into so many different industries and so many different um, personalities um, that it really is just uh, an amazing kind of Swiss army knife to get you into a whole bunch of places. Um, like, you know, as Ada said, like, you kind of dreamed of working as a writer at the New York Times, and it turns out that building election maps and building London Olympic data visualizations was actually the way to get there. Um, and I think that, like, people have a misconception that, like, if you're programming, you're going to be in some closet with a whole bunch of nerds, um, you know, not talking to people. But it's a really social um, and communal and uh, really exciting skill to have these days because, you know, the world is really interested in it and the world's woken up to the impact it can have on different industries. Yeah. Although, of course, if you want to be in a closet full of nerds, um, you know, no, no judgments. <laughs> and I'm sure you could find one. <laughs> so, I would tell us, um, talk, let's talk about what, you know, what is, because I think that, again, like when you're a beginner, um, it can be so confusing from the outside. You're like, okay, this sounds great. I want to meet Martha Stewart. Like, I want to do all these fun things, but what, what's it going to take? Like, how do I transition? Um, you know, what skills do I need to learn? And I know that, um, you know, one of the things that like the Skill Crush and Flatiron School both share is that we tend to push students towards web development skills. Mm -hmm. And I, I have this slide, even though, you know, I know a lot of what we're talking about in this workshop is not sort of focused on the core technical slides, but I would love to hear from you, like what, you know, how come you guys have focused on web development skills at the Flatiron School? Yeah, um, so I guess, you know, um, as I said kind of earlier, like I, I think my favorite thing in the whole wide world is the internet. Um, I think the web is a tremendously powerful platform um, that has basically got three billion people on the planet connected to it so that the kinds of things we build on the web are just, you know, can touch so many people's lives and have such massive impact. And, uh, you know, I was talk I remember like eight years ago, I was talking to a friend of mine named Yehuda Katz, and he told me that he thinks programmers change the world more on a daily basis than any other profession. Um, and I really think we see that kind of every day today. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of talk about, like, mobile, and I think mobile is a great platform, but, you know, the thing is about mobile, the mobile platform is turn your phone on airplane mode and then see how much fun it is to use. Um, just realize that the majority of the mobile apps that we love are actually still connected to web backends that are providing them data and functionality. Um, so right, so the distinction you're making is, like, a mobile app that you could use on your phone in airplane mode versus, yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think like, uh, I think what you guys do really well at Skill Crush is kind of, um, you know, kind of give people a really good progression to get one of these skills at a time. At Flatiron School, we really try to go full stack right away and teach you everything because we want to make sure that you can get, um, you know, that you're open to as, as wide variety of jobs as possible. So we teach HTML and CSS, um, you know, which is really the design side and the front end side of web development. Um, we teach our favorite back end language is Ruby. Um, I'm, I've been programming in Ruby for like nine years. It's my favorite thing. It's we mine too. <laughs> um, we teach SQL, which is a language that helps you communicate with databases. And then we teach Ruby on Rails, which is a web framework for using Ruby to build web applications and basically deliver uh, the results of SQL and HTML and CSS to the browser. And then JavaScript and jQuery and Angular and Ember are just uh, you know languages and frameworks for making the web interactive. So you know every time you click on a link on the web and you know, a little window pops up and things like that. That's all JavaScript. 
Um, and you know, with that, you kind of become a full stack web developer. And again, our goal is really to make sure our students are capable and employable in as wide variety of jobs as possible because we are just so dedicated to um, our outcomes. You know, when we make a promise to a student that we're going to be able to change their lives and have give them a new career, you know, and we see an average increase in salary of around forty three percent for most of our graduates, um, we have to we have to take that seriously, um, and that means kind of covering all of our bases. Yeah. Um, I know, though, that one of the things that you really emphasize with your students is the fact that often, or like that, by and large, what coding language you learn is actually not as important as yeah. just sort of generally learning to program. So I would love to hear from you, like, what, what do you mean, like, what's the distinction to you? What is learning to program? Yeah, um, so I think, you know, I think, as I said, it kind of like, I think people have a misconception of, like, what makes a good programmer and what really programming is. And uh, you know, one of my favorite programmers is actually Ada Lovelace. Um, <laughs> you say it Ada, I think it's Ada, but you're very nice too. Okay. <laughs> Pronounce it Ada. Um, so Ada Lovelace, I guess. And uh, you know, me, she kind of conceived. She, she conceived of what programming and computing would be in the you know uh, late uh, 19th century. So like in 1840, she conceived of something called an analytical engine, which would be a machine with which we'd be able to configure to do anything. Um, and she called. She said she predicted that that building these machines and configuring them would, would create what she called a science of operations. And I always really love that term for programming. Um, you know, another really famous programmer named Edgar Dijkstra um, once said that calling programming computer science is like calling surgery knife science, in that it's entirely about the craft. Uh, it's entirely about the tool and not about the craft. That programming has very little to do with computers and almost nothing to do with science. Um, and I really love what Ada Lovelace called it as science of operations because as a programmer I think what we do really really well is give very clear infallible instructions to machines we are teaching machines how to do things that we inherently know how to do and you know when you think about giving clear instructions computers are really stupid they do anything and they can't make any decisions that we don't teach them how to make and if you're anything like me you've probably built something from IKEA before and you know you get this like eight page pamphlet with a bunch of drawings and then you you meant to build a bookshelf but you end up with like a coffee table. <laughs> so it's not always easy to follow instructions. You're like this bookshelf sucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's not always easy to follow instructions and it's certainly very, very hard to give clear instructions. And I think the real art of programming, the real craft is really about breaking things down into small parts because small instruction sets are easier to manage and are easier to repeat and are easier to be correct. And then you've got to take these small parts and then reintegrate them into a larger system. Um, and you're generally kind of trying to mix in some data from other sources, um, like from APIs or other data sources. And then, you know, once you're done, you constantly have to iterate and improve, and improve on it because, you know, the, the most consistent thing about any program is that it's going to need to change. Your, your users are going to want different features. The environment you're in is going to be different. The business needs are going to be different. So you kind of have to be constantly willing to update it and change it and tweak it. And that's also one of my favorite parts about programming because I always feel like kind of like a sculptor where like I have this like, you know, piece of marble and I'm just kind of like chipping away at it and then standing back and looking at it and being like, do I like that? Do I, how do I want to change that? How can I manipulate it differently? And then finally, you just create meaning and value with software. You know, you can, we, we can build things like Wikipedia that put the wealth of human wisdom, you know, at our fingertips. And uh, as I said kind of earlier, the, the impact you can have with software is just so profound. Um, you know, uh, kind of Chris Dixon, who's a very popular venture capitalist, likes to say that software is eating the world. Um, I can't think of any industry that is not, uh, you know, so at some level being, being controlled by software. Um, I think that the only companies that are going to survive in the next 30 years are going to be tech companies. There's no such thing as a non-technology company at this point. Yeah, or if it's not yet, it should become one very quickly. Um, I think, I mean, what I love so much about what you're saying here, and I think it's really important for everyone who's listening to really pause and make sure that you kind of take it in, is that um, I think what you're saying is that the, like you really, the why, right? Like the context and the reason why you're doing the thing you're doing is at, is as important, if not more important than literally, you know, am I using Ruby, am I using JavaScript? Obviously, you know, like obviously those decisions matter and they do have an impact on how you do what you do. Um, but it's really easy, I think, when you're sort of trying to like make your way and, and, and you know, get acclimated to kind of overly focus, I think, on like, should I learn? Like you kind of like, you know, like I think one of, and actually I've seen like you that you've answered like, 
you know, a bunch of questions on Quora about this and we get this question all the time is like, what's the most, like, what's the best programming language to learn? And it's like, you're missing the point. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think people tend to focus on like the really technical details or like the mechanics and the gestures of programming as though like, you know, imagine if you wanted to be like an artist and you were like, well, what kind of paintbrush should I use? And what kind of colors should I use? And like, that's so, that's so missing the point of what art is. Yeah. Or if you wanted to be a poet and you were totally. like, well, should, I, should I write poetry in French or should I write it in Italian or should I write it in Germany? Or in Arabic, right. And it's like, no, you need to like figure out how to communicate something of meaning in a way yeah. that like is going to, you know, be understood and mean something to another person. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So I know that another thing that you guys work on a lot with your students is the soft skills. So mm-hmm. could you talk to us a little bit about what that means and what sure, yeah. all those yeah. are? You know, I think that there's um, so many traits about being a good programmer that are not a really about like your technical ability or intelligence or aptitude. Um, I think that the best programmers are people that are willing to be constantly learning things. Um, you know, technology changes, there are new languages, there are new frameworks, there are new patterns, and you have to love learning. Um, and I think that's also one of the ways in which becoming a programmer really profoundly changes your life is because suddenly you start getting really used to improving yourself and constantly learning and doing these small iterations um, of you know, learning a new language or you know, taking flying lessons or learning a new instrument because you just get kind of in the habit of always being a beginner and being really comfortable being a beginner at something. Yeah, um, and I think this is an area where I think for people outside of, like who haven't kind of made the transition, it's actually like is one of the most intimidating aspects of technology. You're kind of like, there's this feeling of like, how can I possibly keep up? Like I'm, I'm already starting late. How am I going to catch up much less than keep up? But I actually think that my experience of it is that it's incredibly liberating. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, what you end up getting, what, the, the kind of meta skill you end up picking up is just actually learning how to learn and learning how to research and ask good questions and break things down and kind of go slow. Um, and you're just not, you know, you become very comfortable with the ambiguity of like, okay, I don't really know what I'm doing, but I'm gonna figure it out. Um, yeah, that's and it's also kind of it, it like creates, I mean, it's not like it creates a totally equal playing field, but it does, you know, like everyone's kind of in this process of constantly being a beginner at something all the time. And that actually means that as a beginner, to a certain degree, you're, it's like a little bit of an equalizer. Yeah. And I mean, I think what's also really interesting about that is that like so often I find that experienced developers kind of, you know, you start working on in, in one language and you sort of forget what you used to know about a different language. And then you have this kind of surreal moment, or as like my friend Tom Dale, who's like a prolific programmer, says that you know he gets paid a ton of money to learn how to cook. To, he gets paid a ton of money to program, but he just found himself googling how to center a div. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Because you know you can't like I think that you can't remember it all. Yeah. yeah. There's this misconception that like oh man I must have a really good memory. I can barely remember my name right now. Like, yeah, so everyone who knows what, how to center div, I hope you feel really good right now, because... Um, yeah, you know, well, I think what, what we do really well is that, again, we're not intimidated with what we don't know, and we're willing to raise our hands and say, hey, there's something I don't know, and who can help me relearn this? And we're really good at asking Google. Um, you know, people, uh, I remember one of my students told me that they went to an interview, and the interviewer told them that they can't use Google during the interview. No. And, you know, that's such an obscene thing to say, because, like, who, no programmer on this planet is not coding with Google. Um, you don't have to memorize everything. You're going to learn a lot, a lot of details when you're programming. You want to have them be available in your mind so that you know those things exist, and then you want to be able to re-ask Google whenever you can't remember. You don't need to memorize everything. Um, and then finally, I think programming is a tremendously collaborative field in that there's, there's I, I literally cannot think of a program that has been built by one person. It just doesn't, isn't a thing. The kinds of programs we build are way too big to be held on the shoulders of any one person. And you're going to be collaborating with other developers and other designers and, biz- and marketers and you know, business people, whatever that is, <laughs> and then product people. There's just so much that you have to synthesize and listen to. And I think that people that have a lot of good empathy and have a lot of good listening skills make great programmers because they have to take in all these different Uh, requirements and manage all these different priorities and tensions and then synthesize that into software that makes sense. Totally. Um, And I think that goes back to your point too of like this isn't something you do like alone. I mean I know that you did it alone in your parents basement but you don't anymore. Um, Well I also say that 
you know, yeah. that's the worst way to do it. Like one of the reasons why I started teaching and I started the school was because I, I don't want anyone else to learn how to program the way I did. It was really one of the darkest times of my life. Um, no one should be learning this kind of stuff alone. You got to find a support community and, you know, with Skill Crush and Flatiron and, you know, Girl Develop It, there's a tremendous amount of support. So you're not alone through this and you should never, you should never feel alone through it. Totally. And I also, I mean, one of the things that I love about tech too and the culture of technolo the technology industry is that there is so much about the culture that is about teamwork and figuring out how do you work on a team? How do you work effectively on a team? How do you, you know, how can you be agile and nimble and respond, you know, to a constantly changing environment, even when you're 10 people doing it or 20 or, you know, 2000. Um, like, I feel like I've never spent so much time thinking about teamwork as I have in building a tech company. And it's awesome. Yeah, yeah, and then I think finally, just you know, having uh, enjoying the details. Um, there are just a ton of details in building products, um, from the code, from the you know the speed of it, from the the just you know the 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 one pixel off that you have in CSS, and you know, uh, and just loving those details and not getting frustrated with them. I find that sometimes people can be like, well, why isn't this easier, and why can't this just work out of the box? Um, and ultimately, you know, you have to really enjoy that process of, you know, really, really minute details that you need to control um, that don't take care of themselves. So, yeah, I feel like it's like it's the same kind of satisfaction you get from writing like a really long to do list and like crossing it all off, you know, like you have yep. to, to a certain extent, enjoy that process of like, yep. I'm going to like, you know, I'm going to root out all the issues and I'm going to like deal with them all. It's going to be awesome. Absolutely. So. Given all this, you know, okay, so I'm like, yes, I'm excited. I'm going to learn to program. I'm not going to overly focus on the technical skills. Um, you know, I'm going to develop my soft skills. Like, what does this process really, like, what does it look like from start to finish? Like, what do you see with your students? Um, you know, what, how does it work? Like, how do I start from, I've never written a line of code before in my life. I just learned from you what it means to program. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, like, take this big, um, you know, I really, I'm ready. I want to do this. What do I do? And, and what's it going to look like? Yeah, so, you know, uh, I think that, like, being um, honest with people about what to expect is uh, really important because it is an amazing career and it's going to profoundly change your life forever, but it's going to require investments. And I think that sometimes people only think of investments as, as money. Um, and sure, you know, if you want to really do this and you're not willing to just do it alone by yourself, you know, kind of being your head against the wall and Google and, you know, less than great programming resources, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require some sort of monetary investment. But the other biggest investments that I find students, that, that make students really successful, um, are actually time and focus. Um, it's going to take time. Uh, you cannot learn how to program overnight. And if you're not willing to go on a long journey, um, it's, it's really hard to do it. In the sense that, like, you know, imagine like trying to train for a marathon. You can't wake up one morning and run 20 miles. Um, and say that was training. You actually have to like put in the time to go one mile and then three miles and six yeah. miles and nine miles and just knowing that it's, that, that it's going to take time but that's all it's going to take. It's going to take you giving a constant daily effort whether it's you know an hour a day or two hours a day or reading a book on the weekend. You're going to have to put in time to do this. It's not... Totally. I actually think the marathon one is a really good example too because and it's gonna like you know some days it's gonna be really painful when you do it and then other days like I, I don't know I think it's like it's sort of setting the expectation that on one hand it's gonna be hard and it's gonna take a while but at the same time you're also gonna get a lot out of the process right like being able to run five miles is like yeah. no small thing and that's a big accomplishment and you should be really proud of yourself when you get there yeah. um, and I mean you know in terms of the time too like I'm so jealous of all all my students because you know, they're learning these things in, you know, three to six months. Um, and, uh, you know, as whenever they watch me program, they're like, oh, my God, you must have run this stuff so quickly. It took me years. It took me yeah. longer than most people I know to actually teach myself these things. Totally. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you, I mean, and especially because you were having to do, like, all of, you know, make sense of what to learn, when to learn it. I'm sure you learned a bunch of stuff you probably didn't need to learn. You probably made yeah. all the mistakes, right? You were probably yeah. like, what I programming don't... language do I learn? I'm going to spend six months researching yeah. this before I uh, do anything. <laughs> a really funny story, actually, about learning all the wrong things. So, you know, when I was growing up, my parents didn't really encourage me to be a programmer. In fact, they wanted, you know, um, growing up where I grew up, you basically could be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. And um, my parents would not buy me programming books because they're pretty expensive, like $50. 
Um, and uh, I, I, you know, I was outside the streets of New York one day, and there was this guy selling used books on a table. And he had one <laughs> programming book, and it was a language called SGML. And I was like, oh my god, I'm going to learn SGML. I'm so which excited. Is, <laughs> which is such a useless markup language. Um, it's basically like a superset of HTML and XML, and you know, it's not practical at all. But I read that 500-page book, and you know. Um, and then the next thing I think, like in terms of an investment, is that it's going to take focus. Um, and what I mean by that is that there are a lot of details to manage when you're learning how to program. And you're going to have to keep on reminding yourself of those details. And if you're also, while you're trying to learn how to program, especially if you're doing it in, in order to change your career, um, it is probably not the right time to also pick up yoga or to be in an, you know, an improv troupe or to you know, be in a community play or start a rock band. You just have to focus and you have to realize that uh, you're, you're going to get consumed by programming if you do it right, which is going to mean that there's going to be less room in your life for other things. For, you know, you know keeping up with the Kardashians is going to be very difficult if you're going through this process. And I think giving yourself room and, in fact, organizing your life in a way that allows you to put a singular laser-like focus on this task ahead of you of learning the code is one of the best investments you can make. Like, cut everything else out. That way well, it's just you and your code and your job. Well, and it's funny because it's like, I feel like you're saying this as if it's even an active choice, but I actually think that what can happen to a lot of people is that the choice kind of, it happens to you, right? What You might not even like realize or mean to make this your focus, but yeah. it definitely can kind of like, I don't yeah, know. But, you know. You really coach, can fall in love, yeah, right? And we just coach students to, to like, you know, make room like in their head for, for this to consume them. Because again, like if you're trying to pick up other hobbies while you're learning how to code, you're gonna, you're, one of them is gonna go out the window. And you know, again, if learning how to program is important to you and if changing your careers and having all these different kinds of opportunities is important to you, you wanna make sure that that's not the one that goes out to the window. And it requires sacrifice. And it's, you know, it requires making hard choices about who you are and what you care about and who you wanna be. And you know, I don't know how to make that easy for people. No, no. That's it. Well, I think I think though in a way, like I don't mean to um, say that this isn't like a hard thing, but it's like I do also think that it's like it requires sacrifice in the way that anything worthwhile requires sacrifice, right? And exactly. anything worth doing is going to um, you know squeeze out things that are not as worth doing. And I think sometimes it's hard to at you know at the onset to be like, but everything seems worth doing. Um, yeah. But I think it's a good point point to make. Yeah. And then, you know, finally, I think the last thing um, is just, you know, uh, there's a term in uh, startups called ramen profitable, which basically means that your goal at your first startup is to basically become profitable if all you're eating is ramen. And I think that that's really about just being lean in terms of what you're spending money on. That way you can invest in your own company. Um, and I think that there's similar into, you know, learning how to code. Um, you want to you wanna make sure that you've budgeted correctly and you've created enough um, financial freedom and financial flexibility so that if it takes you another month or another two months, you know, you're not, you don't have to throw it all out um, because uh, you want to be able to make sure that you've allowed yourself time to actually go the whole distance. Um, so, you know, think about a budget and then give yourself some padding and be kind of like conservative about how long it's going to take you and not ambitious. Yeah, and especially I think if you're going to do something like enroll in a boot camp, you know, yeah. you yes, because it's like if you're going to make a serious investment like that, you really got to go in, all in and, you know, make sure that it pays off, which it, I think it will, given time and focus. Yep. Um, <laughs> Great. Cool. Um, so what is it like to learn to code? Tell yeah. us. I'd love to tell you guys. So uh, I think there's a lot of interesting things about learning how to code in that are not necessarily intuitive or that people don't really expect and then get intimidated by and that, turn, that really turns them off. Um, and I guess one of the first things I find about students going through this process is that they expect it to be really linear. Um, they expect them to learn, you know, you're going to learn A and that's going to take you an hour. And then learning B is going to take you another hour. And learning C is going to take you another hour. Um, but it's just not linear. It's kind of like an S curve in the sense that like you're kind of like in this pitch black room and the lights are turning on slowly in different parts of the room and giving you a contour, a sense of the contours and where the walls are and where the obstacles are, but it doesn't happen all at once. And sometimes it might even feel like for a week or two, you know, you're just banging your head against something and it feels like you're not learning. But actually at that moment, you are learning. You just don't have like a full fluency or a full ability to verbalize what you've been studying. 
but then suddenly it just clicks and you get you know kind of like a big jump in competency and a big jump in understanding and then again you plateau and it feels like you're not learning and why is this so hard and i understand that i thought i just learned this and why does it keep on getting harder it's just that it's how it takes it, 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 it it's what learning feels like it's a movement from darkness to light and up until you can see the entire picture it feels like you're blind but you're not so you just have to be patient with yourself and go through that process and give yourself time because it will click I have never ever seen a student that did not give up, not learn something. Um, you just got to realize that it's not going to feel linear. It's going to feel more like an S curve with like a lot of epiphanies and then struggles, an epiphany and then struggle. Um, and then another thing too about programming is that people are always really frustrated that their programs are broken. Um, and I mean, I think by definition, if you are programming, your program is broken. Um, you know the. If your program worked, you wouldn't be programming. You'd go home for the day. Yeah. Um, I think there's this constant kind of movement between like, you know, oh, my God, I got everything working. And then I don't know, well, why is this broken again? What am I doing? Um, and, uh, yeah, so just realize that programmers exist in a state of error the entire time. And the second it works, you're done. So get used to things being broken. It's not your fault. It's not because you're stupid. It's not because you're bad at it. It's because that is the nature of this craft, to exist in a broken state. Um, and then, you know, I think that there is a ton, if you really want to take this seriously and, 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 you know, treat this as a career, it's not just mechanical. It's not just, you know, about, like, being able, you know, to define a bunch of methods and make objects and design websites. There's a culture to technology because it moves so fast, and you have to be willing to engage in that. Um, and that means, you know, reading books and following awesome programmers online and keeping up with blogs. Um, the more that you invest in the culture of code, I think the more that the career of code will pay back to you. And I think also, you know, you participating in that, right? Like, I know that a lot of your students write blog posts and stuff like yeah. that. Like, I think that's a part of it, giving back yeah. to the, the, you know, community. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we, we force our students to blog for a lot of reasons. Um, I think that blogging and, you know, documenting your journey, learning how to code is great um, for a bunch of reasons. One, um, you know, I think that when you're going through a learning process, what you're really trying to do is give yourself as many opportunities to verbalize what you think you understand. So sure, writing code is one way to go through a process of, of articulating something you just learned, but it's not the only way. Another thing you can do is actually start writing blog posts about what you're learning. And I think that also gives you a, a tool at your disposal so that when, you, when you're stuck on something and there's something you don't understand, you know what you're gonna do. You're gonna research the hell out of that topic and then you're gonna write a blog post about that topic. Um, it gives you such a good tool for how to get unstuck and then the entire time you're doing that, you're also creating like a lot of coder cred in the sense that you now have a blog that other people are reading, that other people are taking use from, and employers are going to notice that and they're going to value that. Whereas like we, we like to say in the school, one of your goals is to become a no-brainer hire. And if you could imagine interviewing two people that are basically, let's say, as competent programmers as each other, but one blogs and one doesn't, who do you hire? You always hire the blogger. So I think that showing them that you're willing to write and promote and document and explain is really part of that, the, the programming culture. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think the, the other thing is that you're going to get, especially if you start asking people for advice, you're going to get a ton of distractions. People are going to be like, no, learn React. No, learn Angular. No, learn Ember. No, learn this. And, you know, you just got to stay focused. Um, they don't know what you're going through, and they're giving you advice that they would give themselves right now as opposed to where you're at. So there are going to be a lot of distractions when you're learning to code and people are going to tell you, you know, you should be doing this and you should be doing that. And you just got to stay focused and know that um, the best thing to do is finish what you started and then pick up something new. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really good point. Right. So it's like even, even if you're learning SGML, <laughs> the process of finishing that book is going to provide, you know, you're going to get something out of that experience that you're going to, that you would miss out on if you were to kind of jump from one thing to the next. Yeah. And also I find that a lot of beginners experience, um, you know, what I call like learning fatigue where uh, they basically start learning one thing and they only get 20% of the way there because it's a little hard. So they start learning something else. And then that also, they get 20% of the way there and that gets hard. And then it constantly feels like they're, like they're, like they're just learning a little. Right, um, and, and they're the always is, going up probably the steepest part of the learning curve, right? Yeah, and not absolutely. getting the payoff. Yeah, you know, if you're, if you're tired of constantly starting over, you have to stop giving up. 
you have to finish what you started um, because then you're going to at least have a competency in something. Sure, maybe it was the wrong thing, but you, you, you took it all the way and that's going to mean that you learned how to learn, you finished what you started, and it's not going to be exhausting. I also just think... Got, yeah, go on. Even being able to identify that it was the wrong thing is a valuable skill. Yeah. I know that's like not, not something anyone wants to hear when they're like pouring you know, hours and hours and hours of work into something, but yeah. I actually think that's an incredibly valuable skill. Plus, it gives you funny stories to tell in interviews. You know, exactly. That one, time, that one time I learned SGML. And I'm like, I've never heard of SGML. Sounds... Uh... <laughs> yeah. um, and then, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, ultimately, it's going to be a new way of life. Like, I think that... I remember one of, our, one of my students once told me that uh, ever since learning how to program, they clean their apartment differently because they realized that it, was, it wasn't... The way they were cleaning their apartment was, was not efficient, that they were constantly moving the mess around as opposed to starting from the top and ending at the bottom. <laughs> Um, and it's going to change your perspective on, on everything. Um, I think that every single time that we learn a new way of expressing ourselves or a new way of interpreting the world, we basically have a new perspective and a new lens with which to interpret the world around us. We have a new way in which to communicate and connect to the people and things and topics that you know, occupy our lives. So get ready for a lot of changes, and that's going to be, it's going to feel weird. You know? it doesn't, you're going to feel like you're suddenly a different person, um, and during that transition, it might be a little uncomfortable, but, you know, embrace it because it's going to change you forever. Okay. So I just got a time check, um, and I guess there's a lot of questions and we only have 10 minutes left. So I'm going to skip ahead if that's okay with you. And I would sure. love for you to tell everyone a little bit about, um, you know, programming is awesome. Let's just take a moment. We agree. Um, to talk about what the next steps are, what your programs are, and then we will make sure to leave some time for questions because I know we don't want to miss out on that. Um, so what are the specific next steps that students, you know, anyone who's watching could take? Yeah, so uh, we have a pretty awesome platform at Flatiron School called Learn.co, um, which basically allows you to go through our curriculum online. Um, our curriculum is really rigorous. Um, it's, you know, it, it, we, we think it's beginner friendly, but uh, you know, if you've never been on Code Academy, if you've never been on Skills Crush, we think those are great kind of um, uh, precursors to our curriculum. Um, but we have an awesome platform online. Um, it's really fun. It's really community oriented. We don't want you to learn alone. So we have features like study groups and real time chat and live lectures that help you meet other students and collaborate with them. Um, so I think Learn is a great platform. And then in person, um, we have an awesome campus in New York. It's around 30,000 square feet. And every eight weeks, we're starting another program that is a 12-week program. It's from 9 to 6 every day. And uh, we will get you a job after you graduate. We've had over 1,000 graduates. Um, we have a 99% job placement. Um, and uh, yeah, those are two ways in which we can help you learn how to code. Um, and if you check out learn.co, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. I'm basically on there all day and all night answering people's questions and talking to students because it's my favorite part. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that I'm not the only person who does that. <laughs> um, I love this. We have a comment from Cynthia, who I guess is involved in the Skill Crush, uh, one of the Skill Crush blueprints, and she was just saying that she loves TV, but she's totally behind on all of her shows. So um, <laughs> she's she's living the you know the trade offs that you have to make. Um, cool. So okay, hold on one second. Um, yeah, so let's just get to some questions. Um, I'm looking through the questions. So I see one from Adam, and it says, uh, what are the realistic odds of securing employment as a junior developer or even a paid internship without a degree? So often I, when I see student outcomes and stories from a variety of boot camps and online schools, they inevitably slide in the minor detail that they either got their four year at the same time or already had one or are changing careers. So I guess there's... I'm not totally sure if Adam is asking about a computer science degree or a college degree, but I actually know that you guys have dealt with, you deal, I think the, I mean, I, I would guess that all of your students don't have computer science degrees. Yeah. I know that you also have had students who don't have college degrees. Yeah, I would actually say 43% um, uh, of tech workers in New York City don't have college degrees, let alone computer science degrees. I don't wow. have a college degree. I don't have a oh, computer yeah. science degree. That's it true. Is, <laughs> in fact, the norm is to not have a degree and be a programmer. Stack Overflow just had a, a, a huge survey of all of their users. And again, it was clear, 30% of Stack Overflow users don't have college degrees, let alone computer science degrees. The idea that the majority of programmers have computer science degrees is a total fallacy. 
Um, it's just not, it is not the norm, it is in fact the exception. Um, computer science programs do not create enough developers to meet demands, and other people are turning to programs like Flatiron School and Learn to augment their workforce and find developers. Um, so I think the odds are tremendously, tremendously likely, especially if you're committed to it and you love it. Um, we have a program with the city of New York um, that is explicitly for 18 to 24 year olds with no degree. And we see the exact same placement rates in that program as we do from our other from, from our main program. So um, we have a question here from Amy, and she's saying some of the ads that she sees have a laundry list of skills and you know want several years of experience even for junior roles. Yeah. And then she's saying also she feels like don't pay very well. So how do you land a job at a decent pay without having those years of experience? Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, these are great questions. Good job, people. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, I think uh, as someone who writes job descriptions, uh, I think one thing people don't realize is that when I'm writing a job description and I'm saying you need to know HTML and React and Ember and Angular and JavaScript and Node and Express, I am listing a unicorn. I am listing out someone who does not exist. No one has all of those skills. In fact, I don't even expect to interview candidates with ha that have all those skills. What I'm saying is I'm kind of trying to describe that if you have any of these skills, I want to talk to you and get to know you. I would say that if you have 50% of the skills listed on most job postings, you can apply to those jobs. Um, in terms of you know, the different pay grades, um, I would say that you know, the closer you get to full stack web development, the more the salaries end up being in the you know, $70,000 range um, as a junior developer. Um, that, you know, as a front end designer or front end developer, I think they're closer to 50, 60 grand WordPress engineers. I think it's a great place to start because, like, you know, getting paid to code is such an awesome experience. And then, you know, on nights and weekends, you can continue your learning process and you're going to be on a development team. You're going to get a lot of support from them. Um, but, you know, you generally want to try to get to, um, you know, the, the like back end and full stack web development. Um, and then, you know, in terms of the experience thing, um, I think that uh, it's, it's a kind of interesting thing this industry does where they basically say, oh, we're only looking for experienced developers, which is sort of like a, 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 you know, a vicious cycle because how are you going to find experienced developers if we don't also invest in junior yeah. developers? And I think that more and more companies are realizing that, like MailChimp and Constant Contact and XO Group and the New York Times are some of our hiring partners that have explicitly created training programs and internships and apprenticeships in order to invest in their own talent pipeline. Um, yeah. The only way you make a senior developer is by first taking a junior developer. So and I think the industry is shipping, is shifting its priorities yeah. a little bit there. Um, I think I, you know one of my favorite stories is like this this apocryphal story that um, DHH got called at some point. I think when did Rails come out? Yeah. So yeah, the story. Yeah. Is what's that, the story? So DHH uh, was was contacted by a recruiter. DHH is David Heinemer Hansen. He's the creator of creator of Ruby on Rails. And this happened around four years ago when Rails was around six years old. He was contacted by a recruiter um, saying that they found his GitHub profile and he has a lot of Ruby on Rails experience, but they're looking for someone with 10 years experience in Ruby on Rails. Do they know anyone? Yes, and, and this is the creator. <laughs> and he said, that's not even possible. Um, and that also happened, by the way, with, with mobile and iOS also. I would see job postings when the iPhone first came out. I would yeah. see six months later a job posting that said two years mobile experience. Yeah, yeah, what? exactly. So it's just yeah. I think the the point that both Avi and I are trying to make is you have to take job ads with a grain of salt, yeah. um, oh, and yeah, like anyway. you know a grain of salt the size of your head. And um, you know, and I will say too, like as somebody who hires a lot, like obviously we want we need we have certain skills that are important, and we try to be very explicit in our job ads about what we're looking for. But um, we also like it's it means so much to us when a candidate has really like understands the company, understands the job that they're applying for, you know what I mean? Like those things do really matter um, and are weighed as much as sort of like, you yeah. know, years yeah. sitting at a desk. Uh, know, yeah, I mean, um, actually, uh, just to comment on that too, um, we won't hire programmers that don't use Learn. And we've, we've had amazing candidates that are super technical competent come in and interview for a job at our school and we've asked them, well, what did you think of Learn? And they're like, what, what's that? I never used it. And we're like, okay, so why are you applying to the school? Like, we have a product. Um, you know, you're a good programmer. You're clearly not at all interested in what we do as a company. Why are you here? And it happens also, you know, my, one of my good friends is Katya from Birchbox. And same thing. 
like they have developers applying to that company and they're like, what do we do? Why, why are you interested in working here? And they're like, oh, I heard you guys need programmers. So yeah, yeah, like, if you're uh, interested in the company, you're, you're bringing more to the table than um, someone that might know, you know, how to use a Redis queue or something like that. Yeah, totally. Because because the problem with someone like that is that you have to you have to build the bridge for them constantly. You have to explain to them like why is it that you're doing this at every stage. Um, I think this is a great question um, from Ibikari Brown, and um, they are asking, can you work full time and learn to code at the same time? So yeah, can, yeah. So I would love. Uh, you know, is, I know this is a big topic of discussion. It is hard. For students. Um, yeah. We've been watching students online uh, try to do that, and it's very difficult. And uh, you know, it's really about. I mean, it's scary. It's what it's about. Waking up at five in the morning, coding for three hours until eight, going to work, coming back at six, having dinner, and then coding from seven to ten every day for like four months. Can you do it? Yes. Is it tremendously difficult? It is is very hard, but you can do it. Um, and again, yeah, it's just I think that a lot of it too has to do with the time horizon, right? Like, are you looking to make this change within three months, six months, nine months, twelve months, right? Mm -hmm. And then I think you have to sort of be realistic. Okay, if you want to make a really dramatic change in a really short period of time, you can't do that. You know, it's like you can't have it all at the same time. Um, you just have to be realistic about what's going to work for you and your schedule. Um, Okay, I have a question that we get all the time, but I want to hear you answer it. So Avi was asking, I'm 37. Am I too old to start such a career? Oh my god, I love that question. Um, I just did actually a Quora AMA, um, and I got that question also. Um, and uh, I just wholeheartedly believe in lifelong learning. And I think that, uh, you know, the first thing is that we've had students well into their 40s. We've had students in their 50s learn how to code and get yeah, jobs. So and I think that... Yeah. I think that employers really value the fact that, yes, maybe this, this might be your first job as a programmer, but it's not your first job, and you've had a lot of experience, and you're an adult, and you're not going to complain about you know, not having catered lunches or not care about the company not caring about your professional development. Um, I love working with adults. I love working with um, new developers that have more experience than 22-year-olds you know, fresh out of college that have never had a job before, and the guy owe them the world. Um, so it is totally possible. Um, again, I mean, you know, I think our best students, and I, I think our best students are in their thirties. Um, they've had a career, and they they were a professional at something, and now they're just they're just switching gear. Um, I also I also really admire people that are able to do that. That are able to look at their lives deep into it, and say, I want to change. I think as a tremendously strong person, and uh, those are the kind of people I want to work with, and those are the kind of people I want to surround myself with. And I don't think I'm alone here. Um, I yeah. think a lot of employers. I also think that, by the way, this is another myth that is propagated by the press. Um, the, the average age of programmers is mid-30s. It's not, it's, you know, uh, the Mark Zuckerbergs, kids like me, um, I mean, when I was a kid, I'm 32 now, uh, we are anomalies. We are not the standard. Um, so, you know, if you think that all programmers are like, you know, 24-year-old, uh, like, white dudes, that's just not what this industry actually looks like. That is something that is propagated by the media because it's a fun story. Yeah, and I mean, I have to say, like, I have so much admiration. Like, we have we have a wonderful student who we talk about a lot who homeschools four kids and learned to code and is now working as a freelance developer. And it's like, I mean, what I mean, talk about focus and time and energy and like dedication. Like that, just like her hurdle to get there was so much higher than some. 18 year old or 22 year old or whatever. I don't know. I just think that's that and that just means so much to a potential employer. Like you're able to make it work. Mm -hmm. I think it's incredibly powerful. So we're totally over time. So I'm going to um, force us to wrap up, unfortunately, although I've been loving this conversation. So, um, so it's been super fun and inspiring to hear about everything you're doing at the Flatiron School, Avi. I, Really enjoyed it, um, and I just want to tell or remind everyone: don't forget to keep tweeting at Skill Crush and at the Flat Iron School about your favorite quotes and takeaways. I know I have a bunch um, that I would like to tweet, and um, if you if we see your tweet, you will be entered to win one of two free Skill Crush blueprints, um, which as Avi said, are a great beginning place to start. And then, as we also mentioned, everyone who attends will be getting a $250 coupon for um, Flatiron Learn Verified Program. And you'll also be getting two awesome eBooks full of info that you need to get started looking for your first tech job, starting to understand you know, what jobs in tech look like, what kind of time frame, um, and more about the success that Avi's having at the Flatiron School. And we'll be sending those um, as a follow-up email, as well as a link to replay this 
webinar if you missed any part of it. So just make sure to be on the lookout for an email from us. Um, and Avi, I think you mentioned this before, but if you want to just tell us one more time, where can people find you if they have questions about the Flatiron program? Um, yeah, you can just email me at avi at flatironschool.com or go to learn.co. Um, and thank you so much for having me, Ada. This has been so much fun. Um, I'm so impressed with the questions that your students asked. Um, you know, generally, uh, we, I get asked things like, you know, oh, but isn't machine learning going to, like, make programming not important anymore? And uh, other kind of questions. So uh, I thought the questions were really thoughtful and great, and I had a lot of fun talking to you. And, cool. Uh, awesome. yeah, yeah, and again, also, of course, if you have any other questions or concerns, um, we're always here to help you. So, um, and that's you too, Avi, should you want help from us. <laughs> so you can send us an email at hell at skillcrush, or we also do live chat, which I think you guys also have too, um, on skillcrush.com. So we would love to hear from you. We'd love, you know, both myself and Avi would love to help you make this transition um, and sort of, you know, we'd love we'd be honored to be a part of your success story and we hope to you know, be featuring your success story in our future workshops. So thank you so much for coming and I can't wait to read all your tweets and thank you Avi and it's just been a pleasure all around. Thanks guys, have a great day.